Thank you all. Um, you know, it, it's so easy to, uh, to do church around telling people you got to try harder, you got to endure, you got to hang together in tough times. And that's part of what we do. But that song is right. Um, and if somewhere in your idea of being a Christian, it's this idea of you hanging in there or you enduring, that's not it. I mean, I want you to let go of that. This is all about God's endurance. I mean, this whole work of us following Jesus is, uh, is not about our strength, but about His. It's not about us running to Him, but it's about how He's run to us. And today, as we celebrate together with these elements that Jesus held up at the Last Supper with His disciples, uh, this communion, it's the time for us... Uh, to get together and remember that. If, if you're here today, we invite everyone to celebrate this with us. We're not one of those congregations where you got to uh, be uh, a member here. Uh, we're not here to, uh, you know, evaluate all of that. So if you came in today, everyone should have received one of these, right? Did you get one of those when you came in? If you did not, would you just raise your hand? We're not singling you out if you need one. Instrumentalists got a few down here. Some folks came in that need them. Anybody upstairs? There's anybody upstairs that need them? They're all good? Okay, all good up there. Great. Thank you all. Because we want you to remember that. Now, I don't want you to open it yet. Uh, y'all know it comes prepackaged, but a little quick instruction for anybody who hadn't seen this. We're going to open the small side first later. Okay? Unless you somehow know how to defy gravity. Um, <laughs> You'll have to open the side with the bread first, and we'll, we'll do that a little bit later. But remember that, hang on to it. Look at it often for, it, it contains what, what is just a tiny piece of bread and, and not enough of a swallow of grape juice to really uh, quench your physical thirst. But what's in here can fill you and cover you uh, forever when it lets us, remind us of what Jesus did for us. Um, you know, we're in a series about, these next steps of uh, following Christ, being fit for life. And, and so often, this idea of fitness is about building up endurance, right? It's about being able to last. We watched maybe some football games yesterday. It's about those athletes that could endure to the end, that lasted, that they were in better shape than those that were around them. I want us to not, not focus on that kind of endurance, I mean, really being fit for life as a follower of Christ is, is letting go of this idea that, that it's about how good you are at this alone. It's really about us getting through this together. Are you with me on that? That's why it's called communion. That's, we share this in common when we come to it. Uh, some Christian traditions use the Greek word for thanksgiving, Eucharist, uh, that's there. Uh, many of us in Baptist life grew up having it called the Lord's Supper, but we're doing it at like 1130. I don't know why, uh, but we remember uh, whatever we call this, we need to remember what it's about. So we're in Colossians chapter 3 is where we're going to be because uh, in this series, we're realizing we're saved to grow as followers of Christ. Um, we, we get together, uh, and I kept trying to, Mark kept asking when the women's Bible study would start. I kept telling him it was at noon, uh, but it's like in a couple weeks. But really, we get together for those. We've got Bible study groups that meet on Sunday morning at 9.30. And if you're not in one of those, it's a great place for you to get connected and plugged in with somebody. And then also, it's a great place place for you to grow as followers of Christ, because as we learn and study, we get shaped by God's Word, by the Holy Spirit, by our community that we have together. And uh, we remember uh, this, where we ended last week, was uh, from Mark, uh, and it says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me, Jesus said. Now, uh, I don't know if you're one of those people that works out. I've got two son-in-laws that do. Uh, one's uh, does CrossFit, if anybody ever done CrossFit, anybody ever done, no, but you know what that is. It's not about 
the cross of Jesus. It's about this idea of cross training and, and being fit. And it's this kind of camaraderie that develops uh, among those that work out in that gym, uh, so much so that it can even become a family event. Uh, and then another son-in-law does a thing called F3 Fitness. I mean, apparently it's gotten so big, but it's a, an early in the morning men's exercise group that happens, and it's faith-based, and it's got so powerful that even the New York Times ran an article on it this week about uh, how it, it's really kind of spread around. This idea of being engaged in, in being in, in shape, but, and that's good, but you know what? Whether you can lift or run, is not material for being in shape as a follower of Christ. I mean, we, we have a way of being, being in fit, and that really starts first by, by letting go of some things. And Paul covers this in Colossians chapter 3. The text is right here before you. It's on the screen. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Notice the have been, the passive uh, voice there. It's happened to you. You didn't do that to yourself. You have been raised with Christ. Then set your hearts on things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, right? Now, again, y'all may know the joke. Sometimes there's people that are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. There's balance that you've got to have. But we've got to remember our minds, our hearts, our very lives are headed heavenward in Christ. And we've got to focus toward that. And so he goes on to say this in verse 3, for you died. That, that's encouraging, isn't it? Spiritually, you died. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. In other words, it's locked away. It's in the vault. It's secured. I mean, he's got that where where it's never going to be let go of. And he says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's good. Just, I mean, if you don't hear anything else today, if you came today needing some kind of encouragement, just one little tiny handhold uh, to have, man, circle, highlight, grab that truth right there. But the scripture continues. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. I mean, we live in a, a capitalism economy, and I, I always think a lot of things that end in ism can become an idol if you're not careful. And so that all said, he lists these things that are really indicative of the flaws and shortcomings of what we see in our world today. I mean, it's so easy to preach a sermon about how bad the world is. Genesis 3 he already tells us why that happens, because it's about me I'm right, you're wrong, what I want is good for me, and however I get it from you doesn't matter. And you don't get to tell me that I'm wrong. That's not new. It's bad. It's out there. It's obvious to us. Maybe you've lived your life somehow unaware that there was that undercurrent going on, but you can't live that way today. But it's been that way always. I'm not minimizing, but I'm telling you, it's always been that way. And Paul writes of that, and he says, put that to death, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. We don't get to tell somebody else who's not in Christ yet how to be until we've done it. Until we exemplify having died to self and put to death those things in our earthly nature, we must be, we must be very careful at putting ourselves on the pedestal to display for how people ought to be. Because you know what? When you're on that pedestal, you become, A, a really good target, 
and B, an obvious display of frailty. The only thing that ought to be put up high is Christ Jesus. He's our Lord. He's our example. And we are in Him, it says. So again, all those things that it lists there, the sexual ethic issues that are in our world today, the alphabet soup by which people desire to call themselves some that are there, that discomfort that all goes with that, that that stuff is definitely wrong, and it's that way because we live in a world that has fallen. Genesis 3 says that humankind has chosen to be selfish and is certainly in denial that they could possibly be wrong about anything. And Here we go, verse 6, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. And you've heard me say this, if you haven't hear this, the wrath of God isn't just one of those words that when you preach, you're supposed to say it the right way, the wrath of God. It is the, not the anger of God, it's not like the father that steps in and says, I've had enough of this, don't make me pull this car over. The wrath of God is the result of His holiness coming into contact with sin. The the light isn't angry at the darkness when you flip the switch and it's chased out of the room. The light just does what the light does. And it sure feels like anger to the darkness, for it is shamed and sent running. And so is the sinfulness of humankind at the approach of God. His holiness chases away the darkness. But don't you love verse 7? Just if you got comfortable, he says, You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. I don't know, I'm looking, I'm coming into life with some of you, and, and you know, y'all are so sweet, some of y'all are so perfect, you're so wonderful, you're in church all the time, and you probably never did any of those things. Wrong. Right, we got to remember that that was us, but even so, we used to be in those ways, that list before in verse 5, which we could look at and say, hey, I'm not doing that. But he says, you now must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. It's like, Paul, man, cut us some slack. Anger and rage. What about when the uh, referee makes a bad call? Malice. Yeah, there were some of those yesterday. Malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Man, before we say, look how bad everything else is, realize we still forgot something in us we can work on. We still have something we can be a part of. And so that said, as we move forward together, we're, we need to be, have this one thing about us and look at this list Uh, about how to continue to get a grip on these things. Uh, Richard Foster in Celebration of Discipline is is in this book, and it's one that I suggest you have in your library. Uh, Again, and I'm pulling this kind of outline from him uh, today, these things here. He's got four disciplines that happen together in the church, confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. And, And today, we're looking at confession. And that is this stating our sin to each other. So take out a piece of paper, write down all your sins, and pass it down the pew. No, (laughs) I'm not, not doing that to you. But there is something about our very presence that is a confession, is it not? There is no booth into which we enter, no... uh, person well-trained and, and servant of the Lord to whom we will speak into their ear. Our, our confession of sin is first aware of God's awareness of us, and it is personal, but the fact we're all in this together means it's combined, it's communal, it's corporate, it's the body of believers. We acknowledge that together together. 
So uh, this idea of confession is a little bit like letting go of extra weight. Now, y'all know I'm a backpacker. I have learned from like my early experiences, I don't have to carry as much as I carried like in my first times I would go. I mean, I've kind of learned how much water I need to carry, how much food needs to go on the journey because I remember carrying that weight and going, well, this is tough. And then you take off the backpack of like 45 pounds when you get to your destination and you realize just how much you were carrying. Or if you've ever one of those person that trained wearing ankle weights and once you took them off, you felt like you could jump 10 feet high. We carry too much and we must let it go. In confession, it begins with that admission that we are sinners prior to being saints. There is that vision in the judgment of God that moves us to that place of holiness. John, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's another one you need to know. I mean, now you need to know the context of it where he's saying, Look, if you say you don't have any sin, you're a liar. Not, it's not my words, that's in the Bible. I'm not calling you that. It's there. But again, we need purifying. Now, the next thing I want us to look at is that not only is confession admitting we're sins prior to being saints, confession is something that is specific and not general, Right? Now, I, I, again, I know we learn to pray prayers like, God, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies, or uh, forgive us where we failed thee, those kind of little lines that we're so used to saying. Maybe we ought to tighten those up a little bit. Now, I'm not saying when you come up here and pray in public, you need to say, you know, forgive me for like, you know, robbing the bank this week, dear God. No, but when our confession happens among the community, we ought to be clear about it. You see, sometimes you need someone to say, that's wrong. I mean, we're not here to like pick on one another, but you might let somebody kind of into your life enough in a relationship that gets built enough with somebody who can be close enough to you. Because remember, everyone that's in the body of the church had to admit they were a sinner to be here, right? That's, that had to happen. But when you can get that connection happening with somebody and they can say, hey, that's broken about you, and you will listen to them, then you can move on. Leviticus 5.5 5 says, when anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in these matters, it's in this listing of sins. And, and again, thankfully, we don't follow all of those things. But when they're guilty, it says they must confess what they have sinned. That's that call in Leviticus. There's this sense of specificity that can lead to wholeness and, and help. I leaned in a little bit to y'all last week that I was apparently born with a congenital heart defect, a mitral valve, that was eventually going to go bad, right? It just, it came from the factory that way, apparently. And uh, Kelly kind of knows this. I didn't tell her, but, you know, a doctor had told me years before that yeah, I, it was not good. And he said, eventually, he says, these little strings that, keep, that make the valve, you know, your valves are supposed to only do this in your heart. And he said, eventually, these little kind of like strings, one of them's going to pop, and the others will pop. And he said, you'll know when it'll happen. And he says, what'll happen then is that that heart valve is going to swing like a, uh, like a saloon door, which is not a good thing on a Baptist preacher's heart. But he, he said, they just will flop around and the, the blood's not going to all go in one direction. He said, you'll, you'll know that'll happen. And I was like, great, never will happen to me. Fine. A few years go by, you know, I'm exercising, I'm working out, and I notice I'm getting a little out of breath, right? And I'm laying there in bed, and instead of my heart going bump, bump, I kind of hear it going bump, whoosh. And like, it shouldn't do that. I can hear it doing that. But I'm like, it's okay. I just need to work out harder. I need to run for, I'm not, she's like, yeah, that's exactly what he did. I need to run her. And I still remember like running one time and like going, if I can just make it back to the house. 
And Kelly put her head on my chest, and she says, your heart doesn't sound right. And she tricked me at the doctor's office. I thought we were going for her. And the doctor, whom I'd known for a long time, uh, she said, why don't you put your stethoscope on his chest? And he does, and his eyes get this big. And he was a friend, but he put his stethoscope on his, my chest, and he says, whoa, that's not good. And he sends me to another guy I know who does an echocardiogram, and, and he says, oh, this is obvious. And then I go to a cardiologist, and he says, as he listens to my heart, he says, I wish I had a whole line of medical students because you got a text ba- textbook blown mitral valve. This is so easy to diagnose. I was like, well, great. I'm glad I could help you out. Yeah, and I said, what do we do? He says, it's got to get fixed. I was like, well, yeah, okay, so what do we do? He says, That's, you, know, you got to have surgery. you got to have this thing fixed. I was like, okay, so we do more tests, and they're like, oh, yeah, it's obvious that that's it. I mean, again, I'm trying all those things to find out that didn't need to be fixed or that I could do something else about it. And they said, this has got to be fixed, like, right away. And I said, well, what if it doesn't get fixed? You, you'll die. Like, soon? Yeah. I was like, but I'm supposed to go tomorrow and go hiking and camping with my son. And they kind of looked at me like, are you serious? And I said, yeah, we're leaving in the morning. And they're like, well, you're not going to go very far before you have to take breaks. And so to kind of end that story very quickly, I, I went, I came back, and, and thanks be to God, uh, there was a surgeon there that had great skills and did robotic surgery and went in and could repair the valve you know, instead of replacing it and stitch things together and it all works, praise God for that. And that's seven years ago, right? Here's the point. Somewhere along the line, I finally had to admit something was wrong. And I know guys, we're all like that, right? I mean, we don't go to the doctor. We keep thinking, oh, like, yeah, I know what it is, but I'll get better. Don't no, go to the doctor. But all of us know something's wrong with our heart spiritually. You know it. Just as sure as Adam and Eve knew it when God showed up and said, where are you? And they ran and hid. You hide the sin in your heart and you tuck it away and you think nobody knows. Yeah, God knows and somebody knows. Let them tell you because it can be fixed. Let it go. Confession is that letting go of what you've had and moving forward. For, uh, you know, discipline, it, discipleship as it is, this discipline is something we value in athletes and artists, but we avoid in our faith when anybody tries to tell us that there are some specific things that we can be doing that help us to follow Christ better, right? I mean, nobody gets better at being a follower of Christ. Nobody really opens their heart up for God's examination and Him to speak to them by sitting and listening to one sermon for about 30 minutes every week. This is a full-time gig we're called into as followers of Christ. 168 hours of the week we get to be a part of this. And so when we do this, it opens the door to this discipline that can happen, not, not in harshness, but in love. I mean, really, you'll never hear the Spirit or anyone truly following Christ come up to you and say, look, you're just pitiful. But they'll tell you, look, I love you, and I want to help you through this, and I'm not going away, and I want to be a part of it. That's why James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Can you see, church isn't about the great entertainment show. That's not it. The body of Christ is this place where healing happens because we finally admit this. And we need somebody to help us, whatever it is. Uh, It may be you're going like, I have filthy language and I cannot stop, right? I really thought everybody here was mad when I moved because they kept saying, damn B. (laughs) It's 
true. Now I know it's actually a town. I slipped that one in, didn't I? <laughs> but that's the truth, isn't it? Right? Is it, we, we need to uh, have things we have to work on that in our lives. Aaron, you know what it is. Get somebody to be accountable with you. Somebody to talk to you about that. Somebody you can open up to about that. Because you're not the only one struggling with whatever it may be. It may be... Um, uh, anything that, that happens wherever you, yeah, you have maybe anything from self-loathing or maybe you're, uh, you need to have a little bit of uh, less selfishness. I mean, whatever it is about there, you need to have somebody who can talk to you about that. Open up for that to happen because you cannot do it yourself. Really, I have a question for you. Do you think you're really good at knowing your personal potential and limitations or are you a lot like this little kid? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you think you can do it, but everybody else is looking at you going like, uh-uh. You have those limitations. You need to know how strong you really are. Because what you hold in your hand today may feel really light, but it's actually unbelievably heavy. Is it not? for confessing our brokenness, our sinfulness, being, having, realizing we need that heart repair done means denying your own strength, your own self. It means taking up the cross of Christ, that instrument of torture and death and humiliation and following Jesus, and we follow him even unto death. For what is after death for Christ? and is after it for us, the resurrection. So we hold today here in our hands this cup of communion. In 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul is speaking of this to the church, he's, he's telling them, he says, you need to examine yourselves when you're a part of this. And a lot of times people think that means like, well, okay, I need to see if I'm okay with God today before I do it. And that's not what that word examine is saying. It's actually saying, just, you need, to, you need to measure yourself by this. You need to be aware of what's going on in here when you do this. For when you open that top and you look at that bread in the moment when we flip it over and we'll look at that cup and we hold up this tiny piece of, of bread and we look at it, we realize this, which represents for us the body of Christ, which is broken for us, is done so not for somebody else down the road, but for you, because of you, and dare I even state this truth to you, by you. That is why Paul could repeat the words of Christ when he said the night before he was to be crucified, he took the bread and blessed it and passed it among them. And he said, look, he said, take this. This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the text says that he took the cup before he passed it among them. He blessed it. And he said, this cup is my blood shed in the new covenant. It, it paid the price for the new relationship with God, that fulfillment that he would be the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And he says, this is, is done for you. When we examine ourselves, we let go of anything about us that could have deserved this, earned this, paid for this. We had the Son of God, the spotless Lamb of the world, 
do this for us. That's why Jesus could say, take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. The scriptures say to us that each time we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And when he comes, we will appear with him in glory. And when he comes, we will be right. Until that time, we live, we deny, we take and carry a cross, and we serve him, one another, with this confession as sinners, now saints, as those who are aware specifically we have ills in our life and we are willing to love and be discipled as we follow him together. For this confession at communion is about admitting our personal responsibility for the crucified cross, Christ. As we ate the bread and drank the cup, we confessed. We are the ones. Would you stand with me today as we move into a time of decision? Uh, you-